Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Maroon Friday edition of the Yard and Super Bulldog Weekend. We're already beginning to feel a little bit of the traffic crunch in the great city of Starkville. A lot of people came up last night, got to spend the whole weekend here. We look forward to that. Many of you are still uh, searching for tickets for Saturday. And I understand they've stopped selling tickets for Saturday. So you're going to have to get them on a third-party market. That's StubHub. Uh, Be careful with all of that. Deal with a reputable ticket vendor. You don't want to spend your hard-earned money on some some tickets and get here. Next thing you know, you can't get entrance into the ballgame. Uh, There will likely be some people selling tickets outside the ballgame. Be careful with that, too. All of that said, a lot of time, effort, and preparation has gone in to ensure this is a great weekend for Mississippi State fans. So we're going to enjoy this. We're going to celebrate our maroonness this weekend, as we should. Big, big series with Ole Miss coming up. It always is. It's always a big series. It doesn't matter. If, I mean, I've said before, I mean, you could uh, you put a ticket. Uh, you could sell tickets to uh, a kid in maroon and a kid in red and blue playing Chinese checkers. And uh, Bulldog and Rebel fans would turn out. It's a very bitter rivalry. And in baseball, there's a little more respect, even though you want to win those games. Because, hey, let's be honest, Mike Bianco's done a great job at Ole Miss. There's just not the same level of acrimony, perhaps, in uh, baseball that there is in football. But uh, it's a huge series for both teams. We're going to preview the series here in the next segment of the show. But there are a couple things I wanted to make you guys aware of. A lot of questions out there about how this concert deal is going to go. So the concert is set to begin like 30 minutes after the game. I would allot probably a few extra minutes. There's all it, Things never go exactly according to plan. But Brett Eldridge, country music star, going to perform at Dirty Noble Field. Now, they're not going to allow a lot of people on the field. We may even actually have to tarp the field, so that could uh, complicate things a little bit. But uh, I understand no more than 200 people will be on the field. we got to play a game on Sunday. You know, sometimes I question the wisdom of us playing a game and then having a concert in the middle of a series. But, uh, you know, Brandon Harden and those guys do a great job. They would absolutely lose their minds if that field got damaged. I mean, because at the end of the day, the concert is a bonus event. It's a great idea. I think we should do it every year, but we got to protect that turf, got to protect that field because we got to play an important game on Sunday. So it's not going to be like Woodstock, where you got people out there just camping out and leaving their trash everywhere else and all that sort of stuff. That's not going to happen. But uh, a very interesting event coming up. Once the game is over, they're going to roll the stage onto the field. Uh, they were making some preparations for that yesterday. I understand they'll roll it in. Uh, from the uh, left field bullpen, put it in place. They'll plug in the guitars, they'll get to work, sound check, and then the show. And so I don't know how you all feel about country music. Um, Personally, I think we need to work together as a people to stop the spread of country music. But uh, all of that said, pretty big event here in Star Vegas. So uh, I'm going to give you your disclaimer again. I think it's important to understand some instructions here. Leave early. Understand you're not going to just roll right in like you normally would. There are going to be huge crowds all weekend. I'm sure tonight will be a huge crowd. You know Saturday will be, and I expect Sunday will be as well. Saturday, obviously, a chance for us to break an NCAA record. But uh, I won't be the least bit surprised, you know, if you have upwards of 12,000 for every ballgame. Saturday should push around 20. There'll be some no-shows. I mean, they tell me they've got over 21,000 tickets sold. But there'll be some people that don't make the game. And so if you're, not, if you're one of those people that's not going to make the game, let, let's ensure we get those tickets in the hands of Bulldog fans. That'd be super cool, right? There are a lot of people out there that love coming to the ball game. Tough for them to get chair backs, which is a topic for another day. My honest opinion is, is uh, I know many of you love the berms. You love the community out there. It's a business. My honest opinion is I think we should put chairbacks all the way down the foul lines. It's just my opinion. Find a way. Get it done. And uh, a lot of times, listen, you're thinking about maybe four or five weekends a year where it's an issue. This is certainly one of them. So you, you begin to ask yourself, you know, how do you justify the expense 
you know, when a lot of our SEC weekends, a lot of our chairbacks are empty. And there are some people that feel like, hey, I'm supporting the university and buys and season tickets, and I use them sparingly. But I love Mississippi State baseball. I want to support baseball. And, and we certainly appreciate that. But uh, we also need to ensure that we have people in those seats. And that's, an, again, a topic for another day. I think we've got to make it easier for fans that are not coming to games to be able to, to sell the tickets to the university. You know, I, I had somebody tell me recently that um, maybe the best thing for us to do is have an app and you get a notification or whatever. You get, uh, you know, a text or, you know, a notification that asks if you're attending the game this weekend. And if you say no, would you like to resell your tickets? And you gift them back to the university and then they sell them to other Bulldog fans. I think that's a wonderful idea. I don't know how feasible it is, but in this day of technology, I'm sure they can find a way to get that done. So rather than just say, hey, you can sell your tickets back. I think maybe you get prompted because, you know, if, you, if you're busy, if you've got a wedding this weekend or you've got uh, some other event or whatever, you're not thinking about that. It's like, hey, we're not going to Starkville. And you think, oh, well, it's, it's no big deal that somebody else chooses my tickets. But I think it's, uh, it's something we should look into. But all that said, it's going to be a great weekend here in Star Vegas, and uh, hopefully it's a winning weekend. We spoke with Zach Arnett yesterday, had a lot of discussion with him, even after the cameras stopped rolling. And uh, so we'll talk about that later in the show. But uh, make plans to attend and make plans to get here early. It is going to be wild. Parking is going to be limited. So think ahead and say, hey, we'll just get an Uber. Well, there's going to be a a big crush for that too. So take some personal responsibility. Reduce your own anxiety by getting here early. Really, really early, I would suggest. All right, let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. I love Bulldog Burger Company. I always have. I remember the first time I went and ate there. I did. Had the Bulldog because I wasn't sure. I was a little bit scared of that menu. I didn't know. I was intimidated. It's like, I don't know how many times I'm going to eat here. Turns out it was a lot. But I was like, hey, you know, let me just start with something simple and basic here and see if I like it. And I did. I loved it. Had the Bulldog. And now I've had them all. I've had every item on that menu. It's all really good. They've got something for everybody. That's the thing, too. There are a lot of times you think, well, you know, I'm not in a mood for this. You know, maybe the kids are, or maybe the spouse is, or the significant others, or the rest of the group are. But you can get those great chicken wings. I love those chicken wings. I do. I love how well they're seasoned and sauced. A lot of places you go, and, and basically it's just, you know, it's just a chicken wing. Not really the case at Bulldog Burger Company. Not, not, not saying they specialize in it, but they do a great job with it. But that great restaurant-quality hamburger... That's the hook. One of the fine delicacies in life. I encourage you to go by and have one today. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive here in Star Vegas. Gloucester Street there in Tupelo. Lake Harbor Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. All three locations doing exceptionally well. A lot of consistency with that. As I suggested, maybe maybe if if you're craving Bulldog Burger Company, maybe you stop at one of those two other locations on your way to town. You can feed that craving. And, uh, and get to Starkville and kind of get set up and get ready to roll. Get the chocolate, uh, you know, get the chocolate shake to go. I'm a big proponent of dessert to go. Enjoy life, and you can do a lot of that at Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet, M-E-A-T. All right, let's talk about the Ole Miss Rebels. And contrary to popular belief, we don't talk about them an awful lot on the show anymore. We used to, and we will again. We're not scared to. If it's relevant to what we've got going on, we're going to talk about it. And sometimes it's not going to be good for them. But we're going to talk about it. All right, so it has been an interesting year. Obviously, you remember last year, I mean, the story's well documented. Ole Miss, the last team in the NCAA tournament. And uh, I still submit to you, had they had played that Arkansas State game, they probably don't make it. That's how flimsy the resume was. However, give Mike Bianco and that group a lot of credit. Went on to win an Apple championship. And a lot of it, you know, centered around Dylan DeLucia. He was a guy that came in and took a while for him to kind of find his role, and they got him going. And down the stretch, a man had been a better pitcher in the country last year than Dylan DeLucia, especially in postseason. The guy was outstanding. And I was thinking last year, you know, if Oklahoma had found a way to win game two, they'd probably win an Apple championship. But give Ole Miss some credit there. You do what you got to do. We know how difficult it is to win an Apple championship. We've won one. It took us forever. We probably should have multiple championships under our belt. I still contend we should be LSU, but we're not. 
But uh, a very interesting year for the Rebels so far. They're 19 and 14 overall, and two and 10 within the conference. You know, preseason top 10 team, and I said even the preseason that that was wrong. They did lose a lot, and uh, you don't lose everything they have, and uh, you know, and maintain. But it has been a disappointing year, and a lot of it's attributed to injuries. You know, Hunter Elliott's a guy that pitched opening weekend uh, and has not pitched since then. There's some discussion. He should be back next weekend. Uh, Riley Maddox hasn't pitched this year. There's talk that he may be coming back. And so I, I expect Ole Miss to have a good May. Should be a difficult April. You just begin to ask yourself, you know, will the hole be too big to dig yourselves out of? We're kind of in the same boat, right? We're only a game better than them in the standings. That's what makes this weekend so important. Uh, but Ole Miss opened the year with a three-game sweep of Delaware. 11-2, 10-0, 14-4. of those games uh, called early. They beat Arkansas State 11-3, and everybody's like, man, you know, four straight blowouts against absolutely nobody. They take on Maryland. They win that series, and at the time, Maryland was ranked 13th in the country. Uh, the Terps get them on Friday night. And then Ole Miss battles back to wins games two and three. And then 10-run rule the Terps on Sunday, 18-8. They lose to Louisiana Tech on Tuesday. And then you had the controversial decision on Wednesday, which even though we don't like it, it's the correct call. Louisiana Tech was leading in the top of seven. The game is halted due to weather. And the way the rule book reads that we all agreed to before the season even started is it revert, reverts back to the score of the last completed inning because the home team has to bat last. That we, You've known that about baseball your whole life, right? And so, yes, it looks bad, but those are the rules. So Ole Miss awarded the win uh, against Louisiana Tech. Lane Burroughs had a lot of things to say, and, um, and I understand the angst behind it. It is dif- difficult. And people say, well, they didn't put the tarp down, and it wasn't really about the rain, if you recall. There's a lot of lighting in the area then, and, and uh, while I think it stinks, it was the right call. It was. All right, so <laughs> Ole Miss then heads down to the Cambria College Classic, or should I say up to up there in Minneapolis, and they, they have a good weekend up there. They, they beat Maryland again, 5-1. So three out of four goes away to Rebels against the, uh, the Fighting Terps. And then they play Minnesota, 9-7 winners there in Nebraska, 14-5. So good weekend out there at the Cambria College Classic for the Rebels. Those games are broadcast on the Big Ten Network. On Tuesday, March 7th, uh, the Rebels take care of Southern Miss 11-5. And at the time, Southern Miss ranked 22nd in the country. They didn't sweep Purdue 15-7, 7-6, The middle game of that went 10 innings. But at this point, Ole Miss is rolling, doing a great job. You're like, hey, maybe we were wrong about Ole Miss. Maybe they are going to be able to maintain. And after Xavier Rivas won that ball game against Purdue, uh, the Ole Miss 14-2 and two and ranked fourth in the country. It has been a tremendous fall since then. Again, 14-2, and two, and then they lose at Jacksonville State, 10-6. They're then swept at Vanderbilt, and those games are really not competitive. 12-2, 8-0, 7-2. And we know that we're not in any way talking trash about it. We got crushed by Vanderbilt worse than they did. But a four-game losing streak. So you go from being 14-2 and to 14-6 and in a matter of a week. The Tuesday game against Arkansas Pine Bluff ended in seven innings. 11-1 winners. And then it's a sweep in Oxford by Florida. These games were fairly competitive, but Florida gets the better end of it. Florida, a deeper bullpen, win 9-7, 12-8, 7-4. 7-4. The Tuesday game against Southern Miss, that's a game, and again, it's crazy. You know, they had some turf issues there in uh, Pearl, and both teams decided to go ahead and call the ball game. A lot of people are blaming Mike Bianco and Ole Miss for that. Uh, Scott Berry came out publicly uh, in his post game and said, hey, we, we didn't feel good about the situation didn't want to get anybody hurt. And so it was a mutual decision. And really, it doesn't say a lot for the folks at Trustmark Park. you, you got to make sure the conditions are playable. You want to prevent injury as best you can. But uh, Southern Miss leading that ball game too, and as a good friend of mine pointed out, that's two games that have been called prematurely where Ole Miss was losing, and they're 1-0 in those games. The Rebels then hit the road to College Station, Texas. They lose two out of three. Uh, to Texas A&M, an 8-6 decision on Friday, and then the Rebels bounce back and win Saturday 14-7, to 
and then lose on Sunday 5-4. They're walked off in the ninth. Solo home run to lead off the inning ends the ball game. They bounce back on Tuesday, April 4th to take care of Memphis in Memphis 7-2. And last weekend they lose the series to Arkansas. Uh, Friday they played a doubleheader, moved everything up a little bit. So 11-2 losers in game one. They bounce back to win uh, game two, 7-4. And then Arkansas wins 6-4 in the series finale. And then, of course, Tuesday night, uh, the Memphis Tigers go back-to-back-to-back home runs in the ninth inning. After trailing 9-7, they score four in the final frame uh, to win in Oxford. And then the Rebels bounce back on Wednesday and win that game 13-4 against Alcorn State, as they should. But uh, a couple things you look at here when you get into um, you know, weekend play here. Let's go back and look at the Saturday games. I, you know, Revis being a left-hander, that's going to be awfully interesting uh, to, to, to face him. And, you know, that's kind of been the difficult part for us. You know, Kellum Clark and Hunter Hines have had some issues with lefties. Colton has to a lesser extent. But that, that's a game you really got to watch for sure. All right, so game twos for Ole Miss. They beat Delaware. They beat Maryland. They beat Minnesota. They beat Purdue. They lose to Vanderbilt. They lose to Florida. They beat AM. And then they win game two against Arkansas. So six and two in game twos. And of course, that's the day we're going to have the big crowd here. And State has Landon Gardman going, and I do support that decision. As crazy as that environment's going to be, I don't think it's wise to send a true freshman out there. Uh, of course, State's at out there rotation is uh, Cade Smith tonight, Landon Gartman tomorrow, and then Gerangelo Sanchi. On, uh, on Sunday. And so, to me, that makes good sense. Plus, you give uh, Durango an extra day to rest. I'm still curious to find out why he's not pitching left-handed anymore. They say, hey, we're trying to find some consistency. It makes me wonder, perhaps, maybe if, uh, if things, you know, that little wrist injury thing they talked about earlier in the year, if that's not lingering. And if you notice last weekend, Durangelo struggled against left-handers. It's because he's not used to throwing against them right-handed. And that, that's an issue kind of moving forward. You see, you know, hey, anytime you see a left-handed hitter, are we going to change the glove and we're going to throw and work away, work away? Well, now all of a sudden we're having to attack SEC left-handed hitters in a position that we're not necessarily comfortable with. And so when you go back and think about last weekend and say, oh, he didn't do well. Well, you know, he doesn't have to do that very often. He doesn't have to pitch to left-handers from the right side very often. And so perhaps this week, uh, you've had a chance to kind of get back in the lab and kind of figure out how you want to attack left-handed hitters. But I think that was a real issue last week. So- hey, Bulldog fans, if you were drafting a team, whether it be a college football program, your NFL franchise, a fantasy football or baseball draft, wouldn't it be great if you got all your top picks? That'd be amazing. Well, you can do just that when you run your own business. And if you're looking for people out there to come work for you, you can put a fantasy team together. Thanks to our friends at Indeed. Indeed is a hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't waste hours of your precious time looking for candidates on multiple job sites. Find top talent with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like matching assessments and virtual interviews. How cool is that? Technology is wonderful. You hate waiting? I do. Indeed's U.S. data shows that over 80% of Indeed employers find quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. How cool is that? I run my own business too, and I can tell you this. It's nice to be able to work with Indeed and be sure that you can get people that match exactly what you want. And here's the thing too. You can even invite candidates to apply for your job. You can reach out to them through the Indeed system. And people that you reach out through on the instant match are three times more likely to apply for your job and candidates are just kind of you know, browsing through there. You can be aggressive on Indeed. And here's what you need to know. They understand you're a growing business and you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Visit Indeed.com slash Boneyard to stop hiring right now. Just go to Indeed.com slash Boneyard. Go ahead and find your fantasy draft. Indeed.com slash Boneyard. Some terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everybody. But you need to hire. You need Indeed. Scott for Scott's here. Do you hear that? Bring the mic in close. 
That's not how the grass should sound. There's weeds everywhere on this lawn. It's time to take action with Scott's Turf Builder Triple Action. It gets three jobs done at once, kills weeds, prevents crabgrass, and feeds your lawn so it keeps growing strong. Ah, oh, much better. Get a bag of Scott's Triple Action today. It's guaranteed, or your money back. Feed your lawn. Feed it. Wireless headphones. That'll be $200. I'll use my Capital One Quicksilver card. Now that's a hit. You used the Capital One Quicksilver card, which makes you the hero of every purchase. With Quicksilver, you earn unlimited 1.5% cash back on every purchase everywhere. I wanted running music, but unlimited 1.5% cash back is pretty heroic. Good instincts. Every hero needs a theme song. The Capital One Quicksilver card. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details. We'll see how it goes kind of rolling into Sunday. And it's freshman versus freshman. You know, JT Quinn throwing uh, for the Rebels. So freshman versus freshman, probably a little more of a fair fight in many respects. Ole Miss 14-8 and eight at home and then 3-6 and six away in true road games and 2-0 and oh on neutral fields. But, uh, of course, many of those losses away coming in the Southeastern Conference. But uh, – Again, this is a team that's capable of winning this series. It's a team that's capable of losing this series. It's a team that could probably sweep us if they get hot and, and vice versa. Mississippi State and Ole Miss are very similarly situated, and you don't need your good friend and host to tell you that. I mean, they're 19 and 14. We won 20 games. We're a game ahead of them in the standings. We're 3 and 9 at the SEC. They're 2 and 10. So there's not a lot of difference in the season so far, which in many respects I think makes this all the more important. It's not just a rivalry weekend. You know, the winner of this series kind of keeps their slim postseason hopes alive. The loser of the series is going to be chasing the year, the rest of the year. I think it's pretty obvious. All right, let's take a look at the lineup here. Uh, Calvin Harris, a really good player for them in really all aspects. You know, Calvin Harris, of course, uh, you know, played behind uh, Hayden Dunhurst. They still found a way to get him in the lineup, and now he's getting his opportunity. Uh, but, you know, Mike Bianco – really the entire time he's been at Ole Miss, has, has had a really good catcher. At times, elite catchers. Calvin Harris, a really good catcher. Hitting 376, he's getting it done at the plate, too. Uh, tied for the team lead with a dozen doubles on the year. Uh, six bombs, 27 RBI. A guy that doesn't strike out a ton. Does strike out some. But uh, pretty equitable in many respects when it comes to uh, striking walkouts there. Got a couple stolen bases to his credit, too. Our Kemp Alderman, who closed out the game against Alcorn, which says a lot about pitching depth at Ole Miss, those are the kind of things that get guys hurt, too. Every, like, even when Brent Rooker pitched for us in the SEC tournament, it, it scares me. It does. It's not just throwing the baseball. It's a much different deal. All right, so Kemp Alderman uh, having a career year and, and really has been, been the straw that stirs the drink, leads the team with 14 home runs, hitting a 359 clip, 46 hits on the year, which is second only to Calvin Harris. Eight doubles to 14 bombs, 49 RBI, which leads the team. 18 walks this year, 25 strikeouts. It's a pretty good ratio there. Been hit by one pitch. Has grounded into three double plays. Also has four stolen bases to his credit. Jacob Gonzalez, you know, I've, I've read some commentary about him. You know, people are being kind of hypercritical of him. And I think it's one of those things, too, where familiarity kind of breeds contempt. You expect him to take this big jump. He's hitting 342. Of course, he had the big home run last year against us to force extra innings up in Oxford. He's got some clutch about him. And, yes, he has made some errors this year. But uh, Jacob Gonzalez going to play baseball for a long time. I love his game, love his makeup, and um, was really hoping he'd be draft eligible last year, right? But, uh, yeah, again, hitting 342, 12 doubles, six home runs. Power numbers, maybe not what some people expected. Uh, has been a liability as a base runner in some respects, has a couple stolen bases. You remember um, two years ago in 2021, that's the big uh, strike them out, throw them out, you know, with Logan Tanner, the little sidearm sling out there, and they throw Gonzalez out. I wrote about that extensively in uh, Dogpile. All right, Ethan Groff, the former Tulane player, a guy that Mississippi State was involved in, and uh, ends up at Ole Miss, hitting 339. Uh, Ten doubles on the year, one triple, five home runs, 36 ribbies. What, probably the most the – stat, the stat that I look at with him too is just, you know, pitch recognition. He and Gonzalez both have walked more times than they've struck out. Good job hitting. 
and he also has uh, 12 of 13 stolen bases. So he is the, uh, the most prolific of the base runners. He's not the only one that can steal base for you, but he is a guy that does it with much greater regularity. Uh, Anthony Calarco, hitting 297, uh, 33 hits on the year, seven doubles, four home runs, 25 ribby, uh, has not stolen a base. He is the guy, too, that a little swing and miss in the game there. Ethan Ledge is a guy, too, that uh, has kind of been up and down. They feel like they've kind of got things settled with him. But uh, he has been in the lineup with a lot you know, greater regularity here as of late. Uh, 30 games played, 29 starts on the year. Six doubles, a couple bombs, 14 ribbies. Uh, T.J. McCants, a guy that there was a lot of people last year, middle of the year, that said that uh, he may be transferring from Ole Miss. A lot of discussion that he was going to go in the portal. And then, of course, they get hot and win an Eiffel championship. And he's like, hey, I'm, I'm going to stick around. And maybe that would have been good for him to move on. But uh, it has not been a really good year for him. He's hitting 247. Uh, 24 hits on the year, just three doubles, but does have seven tanks. So power numbers are doing okay. Seven of seven in stolen bases. The problem is to just get him on base. 26, excuse me, 36 Ks, which leads a team. 11 walks. That's not good. So he's not a guy that's getting on base with great uh, proficiency. Uh, Peyton Chatagnier, you know, you and I both know Peyton Chatagnier is a good player. But um, if he had been named, uh, you know, Peyton Jackson or Peyton Smith, he probably didn't end up at Ole Miss because the fact that Ole Miss fans can can say the phrase Chatagnier made him a more desirable prospect. But uh, really good tournament last year, really good in the postseason. But he's hitting 239 this year. Not good. Not good at all. Six doubles, six bombs. But he's a guy that makes me nervous, I'll be honest with you. It's like this is the kind of guy, too, a veteran guy like this that's struggling a little bit. They always seem to find a way to to make a play in a series like this. But uh, 26 punch outs on the year, one of three in stolen bases. But uh, he's not been, I think, what people expected him to be. But still plenty of time to turn the thing around. This is an offense. People like In the fall, people were telling me, some of my college baseball and major league baseball scout friends were like, you know, they got some sticks up there. They do. And then now people are kind of recalibrating and saying, well, I think some of that's because the pitching wasn't there. And if you look at – there's not the depth in this order there was a year ago. Uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, Tim Elko, you know, is gone. Um, you know, and so they do have some guys that can hurt you. Uh, but you can't go out there and walk the ballpark. I mean, this is an offense that um, maybe has not been what many people expected it to be, but they're, they're still hitting 299 as a team. So right around 300, they don't have maybe the power numbers they did a year ago, but they still have 55 home runs. There is some power in this order. It's just a little more, you know, distributed. Of course, you know, Kemp Alderman, we mentioned having a career year up there, but uh, he's not the only guy in this lineup that can hurt you. By any stretch of the imagination. 32 of 39 in stolen bases as a team. The two most prolific guys we mentioned, Ethan Groff and uh, T.J. McCants. Uh, T.J.'s always been a guy that could run. It's one, it's one of the things, too. He, he can track a baseball, too. At times, he kind of loses track of that. But, uh, you know, T.J.'s a guy that, um, you know, is an athletic guy, for sure. Probably a guy that we'll see drafted here in, the, uh, in June somewhere. But 247... It's, it's not good. It's not good. That's the thing. When you get in the bottom third of the order, you know, State is beginning to get some level of production in the bottom third. Ole Miss, not as much. All right, look on the pitching side of things. Uh, of course, they announced the uh, rotation. Jack Doherty staying on Friday, Xavier Rivas on Saturday, and JT Quinn uh, on Sunday. Now, Jack Doherty is a guy that's very interesting. You know, he, he did some things as a reliever. They've made him a starter. And then with Hunter Elliott going down, they've had to push Doherty to Friday night. It has not gone as, as, as hoped. He is 2-3 and three on the year with a 6.57 ERA. I mean, like we look at these ERAs. It's not just us. You know, and it's like somebody on Gene's page yesterday said, this is what 3-9 and nine versus 2-10 and 10 looks like. But Doherty is a guy that um, they had high hopes for. It just hasn't materialized to date. He was pretty good last year out of the pen at times, but uh, four, allowed 46 hits, which is the most on the team. Allowed 30 runs, 27 of them earned, 42 Ks against 11 walks. So he's not walking a lot of people, uh, but he has been somewhat susceptible to the extra base hit. He's allowed 18, which also uh, leads a team. Opponents are hitting 295. So among the three weekend starters, 
He has the highest batting average allowed. A couple wild pitches, a couple hit-by-pitches. Uh, but, you know, Doherty's a guy, too, that, uh, you know, he has good stuff, but he's a guy, too, that when he can't spot that breaking ball up consistency for a strike, it's difficult to keep people off the fastball. That's not something unique to Doherty, but I just don't think the stuff is quite as dynamic as people had hoped it would be at this point in his career. The guy that's very intriguing to me is Xavier Rivas. And we talked about how good they've been in game twos on a weekend. Well, he's a big reason why. Uh, Xavier Rivas, a 5-2 and two record, leads a team and wins. Uh, has had eight starts on the year, which is also a team high, right. tied with, tied with uh, Grace and Sanye. Um, but you begin to work through these numbers here. I mean, you know, 39.2 innings pitch, which is a, 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 a team high. So he's willing to work and able to work deeper in the ball games. He has allowed 35 hits, uh, 23 yard runs, 23 walks to 46 Ks. So it's two for one there. That's not a really good ratio. He's allowed 15 extra base hits, eight of them being home runs. He is a guy, too, that has hit five hitters and had a couple wild pitches. So control has been a bit of an issue. But uh, he is a guy that clearly has been a competitor uh, out of left-hander out of Portage, Indiana, 6'4", 225. Uh, has that nice 80s baseball mullet kind of flowing down the back of his neck there. But uh, has, had, has had some good outings. Struggled a little bit against Maryland. Of course, they win that ball game, but uh, he goes three and two-thirds of an inning, six hits, six runs. Nebraska, four and a third, three hits, three runs. Purdue hit him a lot, but they couldn't punch anything across. They had seven hits, which is uh, ties for the most on the season of an opponent against Rebus. But he navigates through that, only has uh, the one earned run in the ball game, had six punch outs in the game. Vanderbilt, he pitched exceptionally well against them. Five innings pitch, a hit, uh, three runs, all of them earned. Five punches to two walkouts. To two, excuse, two walks, excuse me. Uh, Florida, five and two-thirds of an inning, five hits, four runs. Of course, they, they, they lose both of those games. They win the Texas A&M game, but even in that game, they're able to get to Rebus. Four and two-thirds of an inning, seven hits, five runs, all of them earned, four walks, seven strikeouts. Last weekend against Arkansas, did a nice job uh, in the win. Six innings pitch, five hits, two runs, four walks, uh, seven strikeouts. So, again, this is a guy if you're patient with, uh, he will walk you. But uh, he's also a guy that you're able to kind of get the bat on. But um, has been a competitor. Again, the numbers don't just light you up there. But when you look at the fact how well they've done in games that he's pitched, you know they're going to have a lot of confidence sending him out there on Saturday, regardless of what happens tonight. JT Quinn, a younger guy, has 11 appearances on the year. Six of them starts. He's a freshman from Tampa, Florida. 6'6", 205 pound. Watched most of that game against Arkansas last weekend. I thought he was very competitive. He's not scared to put his stuff in his own and compete. You look at the walk numbers for a freshman here. 36 Ks against 16 walks. You'll take that every day. I mean, 3-1 to strikeout to walk ratio from a true freshman, you'll take it. 518 is an ERA and 3-0 and uh, in decisions this year. 33 innings pitched, uh, allowing just under a hit per inning, but a 228 average against. And so this is a guy, too, and doing a good job getting under barrels. A guy they're very high on. He's just kind of been inserted into the lineup, into this weekend rotation here as of late. But, uh, again, a lot of relief work for him, and then some midweek starts. And then in, over the course of the last three weekends, uh, he has faced SEC competition. Uh, struck out eight last weekend against Arkansas, which was a season high. Uh, surpasses uh, the seven against Florida and seven against Louisiana Tech. And, of course, the Louisiana Tech game ended up losing. But uh, my point being is maybe their rotation's beginning to settle. Uh, defensively, it's been an interesting deal, to say the least, for them. And uh, some of that, too, you know, we look at, you know, you know ERA as a team is, uh, you know, 566. Their opponents, 7.80. And, and you factor that in with the fact that they have played Florida and Vanderbilt, and you know what those teams can do on the mound. It says a lot about perhaps the quality competition that the Rebels have faced this year. All that said, they have been competitive in most of the ball games outside of Southeastern Conference play. And then in recent weeks, they've been very, very competitive. You know, they could have easily taken a series against A&M, could have taken a series against Arkansas. But to date, they have not won an SEC series. Let's look at these defensive numbers. Uh, Kemp Alderman, again, talking about a career year, 
75 chances, 72 putouts, three assists, and a 1,000 fielding percentage. Leading the team in errors is uh, Ethan Ledge. We talked about him earlier. We, we think that they're probably going to settle with him. Paige Chaudnier uh, has four errors on the year. Calvin Harris with three. And considering he's a catcher, we'll let that go. Jacob Gonzalez, just a couple. And uh, one of those happened uh, on a ball to his right against Arkansas. Watched the, saw that in the game. But uh, defensively, they have not made errors with the same proficiency as Mississippi State. That's going to be a big part of this series is we have to play clean defensively. Ole Miss is not going to give you a whole lot. Then, you know, they may walk some guys, as will we, but uh, they're not going to get out there and boot the baseball around. Just not how it's going to work. Now, moving back to pitching just here for a second, you know, really, and this has been the book on them all year, is the bullpen. You always felt like, hey, if we can stay in the game, get their starter out of the game, we've got an opportunity to win. And I'm, in the book on Mississippi State, it's the same thing. It's amazing how close the records are considering the attributes of the team, the team are basically identical in many respects. But this is a team that has really struggled to get people out, especially when the game is on the line. Uh, you, know, you know, Jackson Kimbrell was a guy last year that we saw in the governor's game and uh, had, a, had a good outing, if I remember correctly. But he's had seven appearances this year, and his ERA is nine, 0 and 2 on the year. It just hadn't come together, just six innings pitched for him. It has not come together in any respects. Um, Mason Nichols is, was the guy that was tagged with the loss on Tuesday against Memphis. They were trying to make him a closer. And it, it does appear they're trying to kind of force the issue a little bit. But ERA of 5.85 and a record of 1-3, 12 appearances on the year, 20 innings pitch, allowing 18 hits in those 20 innings. Not necessarily great for a, for a shutdown closer guy. But uh, 14 runs allowed, 13 of them earned, 19 strikeouts to 7 walks. But – you know, the book on Ole Miss is if you can just kind of hang in there with them for a while and get into the bullpen, you got a chance to make some hay. So this is basically a series between two teams that are even in every attribute. Just kind of how it is. We got some big sticks in our lineup. They got some big sticks in theirs. I think we actually have more, but they do have some guys that, uh, that can hurt you. Starting pitching should be solid, and we hope it is for us as well. It's been a little bit better here as of late. And you get in the bullpen, and I, I really believe with the with Nate Dome going back to the pen and Aaron Nixon getting healthy, I would have to give the advantage in the bullpen to Mississippi State. If State can get it into the later innings with a lead, I feel a lot more confident about State being able to close those games out. And so uh, my prediction is, is we win the series two games to one. And I know what I just said about how good they've been on Saturday with Xavier Rivas. I think State wins Friday, Saturday, and loses on Sunday. Just my estimation. Because I think you, who, you're you going to have to go all in tonight. Kate Smith starting tonight. And uh, maybe that means that uh, Kobe Holcomb is paired up with him. But uh, we need the big start. Uh, to be honest with you, there's probably nobody – of the regular starting rotation, I'd rather have on the hill opening a series in Cade Smith. And I understand that he has not had the year that we've hoped he'd had because, of, uh, you know, he's been – had some some medical stuff that's kept him away from the field. But uh, we need him to go out there and be the tone setter tonight. And we need this Bulldog offense to kind of get going against Doherty. And, uh, again, with Doherty, you can hit the baseball against Jack Doherty. You can. And uh, he is a guy that is very reliant on the fastball. And uh, you, we hunt the fastball and barrel some balls up. I think you should be in good shape here. Uh, but, again, need a lot of people out there. Going to be uh, an interesting night. But this is what it all boils down to in many respects. You know, if, if State is going to continue to show some progress, you can't afford to let down this weekend. And uh, we kind of touched on it earlier this week. It has really not been uh, a good stretch, you know, for Ole Miss here, you know, last 10 games or so, you know. Uh, let's see here if I can count these correctly. So, uh, you beat Alcorn State, you lose to Memphis, that's a one and one and then you lose the series. Uh, so, that's uh, one and two, two and two, two and three. You beat Memphis, three and three, and then lose the series against A&M. What's that, four and six? Then you get swept by Florida. You know, 
it's been a rough stretch. So that they have not won a lot of games as of late, and State has begun to win some games. You know, so I, you, you kind of would suggest here that maybe things are trending a little more positively for Mississippi State than they are for Ole Miss. But at the end of the day, there's not a lot of difference between these two teams. And so there's not a lot of trends you can really look at and identify and say, oh, well, this team should definitely be favored. I think when it boils down to two teams that are similarly situated, you take the home team, and that's Mississippi State. And I know all of you will do your part uh, as you turn out to represent the Bulldogs as part of Super Bulldog Weekend. All right, time for today's top ten list. We've got a special one for you today. As always, brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R. Blair is my friend, your friend, a friend to everybody in need. He's a uh, young man that has been in the mortgage industry now for uh, right at 22 years. Top 1% close ratio in the country, three consecutive years. It's time to buy a house. And many of you have said, you know what, Steve, it's never going to happen for us. I'd love to be able to have a home of our own that our family can always have and something we can kind of keep in the family. But the reality of it is, is that uh, maybe perhaps that you have in the past not had the right loan officer. Blair's a guy that's been in this industry, man, for a long time. Works for Fairway Mortgage, a reputable lender. A lot of people out there want your business. Blair's willing to prove it. And here's the deal, too. When, when it's something as important as your home mortgage, don't you want to deal with somebody that knows exactly what they're doing? Somebody that can get you to underwriting and get your loan structured in a way, give you the best chance for approval. Blair's the way to go. And he has closed loans for multiple Boneyard listeners over the years. And uh, I've had several of those people that have reached out and provided testimonials and said, you know what, Steve, I'm really glad I w- went with Blair Chandler. And, again, that's closed at Blair.com. Give them a call or text today at 601-500-2344. Again, 601-500-2344. And if you let Blair know you heard about him on the Boneyard, he's going to pay for your appraisal. That's about a $500 value. How cool is that? Again, that's a nice incentive to kind of keep it in the family. Blair, obviously, he's a bulldog, has a place here in Starkville. Um, multiple season ticket, season ticket holder, multiple sports. So, but again, you don't have to cheer for Mississippi State, uh, you know, to get this discount. You know, it doesn't matter who you cheer for. I know a lot of Rebels listen to the show today as we preview the weekend. If, so if you're in need, too, you know, do, stick with the winners. Stick with Blair Chandler. That's closeofblair.com. All right. So we're going to do a rivalry top 10. I was thinking about it. You know, I was like, hey, we've got some, got some good ideas out there, and I didn't think they fit the weekend. So it's rivalry weekend. A couple of things I want to say. Some of these songs are about war. So no, I'm not equating college baseball to war, so you can save your DMs. A lot of respect for our military people. I'm not in any way trying to suggest that college athletics is the same thing as war. It is a metaphor, so please relax. It's amazing how sensitive people have gotten in recent years. Thanks, Ben Laden. All right, so top 10 rivalry songs, and I'm sure that I probably have missed some, but I was kind of in, in um, kind of in more modern rock vein today. So some of these songs you may not know very well. And uh, we'll start with a band that I've met, and I've seen them perform. And uh, it seems to me like they get better with every album, which is what you want. They're beginning to mature as a band. It's a band called I Prevail. That Lifelines album is phenomenal. Trauma is a follow-up. It's, it's remarkable, too. And uh, I, I listen to both of those albums pretty much in their entirety. But uh, there's one song that wasn't released as a single, so it's a little bit of a deeper track on the Lifelines album. It comes, uh, comes up right after the title track, Lifelines, it's a song called Come and Get It. Come and get it. You know where I'd be. Come and get it. All right, number nine. I'm not a huge fan of this band, even though they have grown on me in recent years. Um, I, I complained on Twitter one time that my wife loved the debut single from this band, and uh, I thought the lyrics were so incredibly sophomoric that it was almost you know, offensive to my sensibilities as a writer. But uh, they have grown on me a little bit over the years. They're not going away, clearly, so you need to kind of find a way to deal with them. And there's some other bands out there I can't stand. My stance on the band Five Finger Death Punch has softened, and I think maybe it's because of the fact when they put Rob Halford on uh, Lift Me Up, I was like, you know, maybe these guys get it. We're going to go with a great track called The Pride. 
the pride. Number nine, five finger death punch, the pride. I used to say it's five finger fruit punch to me, but I digress. Number eight, another bit of a deeper track off the uh, latest Alter Bridge album. I'm a huge Alter Bridge fan. I love the composition of the songs. Miles Kennedy is an absolute genius. Mark Tremonti, I submit to you, arguably the best guitar player in this generation. And he's not just the guy from Creed. Mark Tremonti is Mark Tremonti. He's a legend, and I think it's uh, amazing to see the work that he's done as a performer and had an incredible amount of success and, and also has uh, released, what, three solo albums now? Four, I guess four solo albums now. The first one, the Tremonti album, uh, All I Was, is amazing. They're all really good. I had a chance to meet Mark over in Birmingham. I was very honored to do so and uh, saw Alter Bridge as a unit uh, down at the Sanger Theater in Mobile with the Monster Truck. They were phenomenal. But Miles Kennedy, uh, probably my favorite singer around right now. But it's a song called This Is War. And uh, it, again, Alter Bridge has changed a little bit too. They've kind of got a little bit of Ronnie James Dio in the lyrical content here as of late. You know, there's a lot more cryptic language, a lot more, uh, again, metaphors and things of that nature. But uh, this is a good one. The guitar on it is phenomenal, as you'd expect from Mark Tremonti. So number eight is Alter Bridge, This Is War. Number seven, Back in 2021, I was in Omaha. This is the album that was kind of on my mind at the time. And every time that we li- we won in Omaha, I listened to this album on the way. And so I finally said, you know what? I'm, I'm a baseball purist. I'm superstitious. So when we got into the NFL championship game, we got into game three. I said, you know what? I got to ride with, with the, the band Oleander. And it's a song, Fight. From Oleander. They used to have a version that had Uriah Faber on it too of, uh, of MMA fan. I'm a Uriah Faber fan too. But Oleander, I love that album. Uh, it's amazing. It really is. There's so many good songs on that album. And uh, it's interesting too. You know, of course, I wrote Blooms of Oleander, and uh, a lot of people think there is a connection, and there is. It's because when the band Oleander first came out, I was like, what is Oleander? And then, you, of course, you find out, you know, about the flower. And uh, I've always felt, I kind of stored that away, you know, because you've got this beautiful flower bloom that uh, is poisonous in nature. And I thought that was an incredible metaphor for toxic relationships, of which I've had many. And so I always filed that away. And I said, if I ever, you know, want to reference this again, whether it's writing a song or, um, you know, writing a poem or whatever, I want to go back to that. I want to use it because I think it's, I think it's very fitting. And so I did the poetry book. And I called it Blooms of Oleander. And uh, I write about that extensively in the intro. And, uh, of course, you can find that at uh, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, BooksAmillion.com. It was interesting. I don't know if I'll ever do something like that again, but uh, it was interesting. All right, number six, going back to the early 90s, I love this band. And I think they should have been bigger. Lyrically, they were great, very aggressive. The guitar is phenomenal. It's very in-your-face. But it's not like there are a lot of people that cover up their inability to play by just playing faster and harder. These guys can really play. Uh, so a little bit of melody, but also a lot of punch. It's a band called Warrior Soul. Absolutely love those guys. This is probably the best song off the album. Uh, Salutation from the Ghetto Nation. And a great, great album, too, called, uh, what was it, Last, uh, Last Decade, Dead Century. Really good band. Did not get the acclaim, perhaps, they deserve. They have a great song called... Uh, Losers too, like here's to the losers, and, I, and it's a song that I really identify with, and it's it's basically the flip of that. It's like I think we're beautiful. You know, here all these people have these negative things to say about us because we're different, because we look a certain way, we believe a certain way. So here's to the losers. It's great, uh, but this is a song called Love Destruction. It's about you. You love destruction, and uh, this is what you want. We're gonna bring the fight. All right, number five, a more modern band many of you guys are probably a lot more familiar with. It's a band called Avenged Sevenfold. They just dropped a brand new album called Life is But a Dream. I haven't listened to the album in its entirety, but uh, I'm a big Avenged Sevenfold fan. I've met him, Shadows. Um, met him in Tupelo, as a matter of fact, before the show uh, several years ago when they played with uh, Shine Down and Buck Cherry and Save and Abel. Many of you were there. But uh, they have an, this great album, 
that uh, after Jimmy the Rev died, they had to go out and find another drummer, and uh, they kind of did an album that was somewhat influenced by the music of the 80s. And so they did some songs that sounded kind of in the same vein as 80s rock. And this is one that, uh, that really stood out to me, and it fits our topic today. It's This Means War, Revenge Sevenfold. Number four, going back a few years, when this song hit MTV, I went out and bought the album Damage, I think the next day, at least the next payday. It's the offsprings come out and play. And it's a song about violence. You know, it's not necessarily equated to college baseball, but it kind of fits our theme. But uh, anytime we can work the offspring in to a top 10 list, that's a good thing. Number three, Saw this band live in uh, New Orleans, also with Shine Down, and uh, I can't remember who else is with them. Maybe it was Hellstorm. I don't remember. But no, it wasn't. It was Cavo. It was Cavo, Sick Puppies, and Shine Down, and it was great. Loved every second of it. The Sick Puppies, uh, really good band. And again, maybe doesn't get the national acclaim that they should. You may have seen the video. Several years ago, it made the rounds. It was this uh, old long-haired guy holding up a sign that said, Free Hugs. And the song was called All the Same. And it's a very heartwarming video. It's like he's holding up a sign. All these people are walking by. It's free hugs. They wouldn't take him up. And finally, this older lady comes up and hugs him. And then all of a sudden, it becomes this movement, the free hugs movement. It's amazing. But we're not going that direction today. That didn't fit our theme. It's a song called You're Going Down. Because it's been a long time coming. And the table's turned around. But you're the one that's going down. So Sick Puppies, great bass line on this one, kind of in your face, too. And uh, if I, I, I'll be honest with you, too. If there's a band out there, especially on this list, I love all of these bands. That said, if you're just kind of a straight-line rock and roll person, like, if you, if Steve, I don't like all the yelling, and I don't like all the fast play, and I'm a, I'm a delicate little flower, but I like a little bit of radio rock, your Sick Puppies may be a band that you need to look into. Pull up the essentials on iTunes and, uh, and go through there, and there's probably a handful of songs uh, that you know. And uh, Riptide's an incredible. We, I could probably do a top ten of the Sick Puppies, but um, they're a very talented band, and uh, it's kind of soccer mom-friendly if you know what I'm saying. There's some edge to it, but it's okay. It's not going to be too bad. All right, number two, one of my favorite songs from the great band Breaking Benjamin. I've seen them, I think, five times now. Uh, I know we saw them with Corn, saw them with Shine Down, Seven Dust, um, a few other bands. For a while, I didn't know if I'd ever get to see them. They went on hiatus for a while when uh, Benjamin was having all his uh, anxiety issues. But they're great, and they're great live. As good as they are in the studio, they put on an amazing show. So if you get a chance to go see Breaking Benjamin, go check them out. I know the homie Fred loves Breaking Benjamin. Shout out to Fred. Go download Storage 24 single, Anger Management. But Breaking Benjamin, love this song, I Will Not Bow. And it's obviously a song about strength and adversity. Uh, it's like no matter what's going on in your life, it's like, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to go kiss the ring. And uh, it's interesting. I had somebody ask me about some comments along those lines that I posted some years ago, which I thought was rather interesting. But uh, I'm not that kind of person either. You know, it's just like, you know what? I know when to take the loss, but I'm not going to give up the fight, right? You know what I'm saying? I'm going to fight until it's been determined. But I will not bow from Breaking Benjamin, uh, very apropos for the weekend. But number one, that's a shout out to Marley there. My dog decided she wanted to join the show. Maybe she doesn't like Breaking Benjamin. All right, but number one, one of my favorite songs of all time. We're going back. I bought this on 45 because I'm from the 1900s, and many of you kids don't know what a 45 is. It was a small vinyl. It was a single. You had one song on each side because what you're buying today is vinyl. It's 33 and a third. We had 45s, and there were some 78s. I didn't have many of those. But uh, had this song on 45 on Krishna Records, or Don Krishna Records. It's Kansas's Play the Game Tonight. Great song and uh, matches our theme, but stylistically doesn't match the other bands. But again, it's just good straight rock and roll. A great American rock band, Kansas. Anytime we can work that in, it's great too. And these guys obviously are on the tail end of their lives, not just their careers. So if you get a chance to go see Kansas, go check them out. And there are so many bands today 
they're kind of influenced by bands like, uh, you know, Yes and uh, Rush. Those bands were influenced by Kansas. And so when you go look at kind of the, the tree that is rock and roll and you look at the vein in which everybody comes up, all these prog rock bands of the day owe a debt of gratitude you know, to people like Yes and Rush, who in turn owe a debt of gratitude to Kansas. Kansas, really one of the original prog rock bands. Some people disagree. They'd be wrong. You have ideas for the top 10 list? Reach out and let us know. We've had a lot of ideas as of late. That doesn't mean that yours it may not be better than somebody else's. Reach out to me or Roy. Roy, you can find him on all forms of social media at Dogmatic67. That's D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. Also, our great list are hosted on Spotify on that same channel. And I'm on all forms of social media at Scout Steve R. Uh, be sure and hit us up and let us know. And uh, if you're looking for a list, we'll try to find it for you. But uh, we've done a bunch of these over the years. And uh, this is one, every time we have like a rivalry week or something like that, you know, during football, we have like Ole Miss hate week and that sort of stuff. Um, but these, listen, all of that aside, this is a great list. Even though I'm the one that put it together, if I do say so myself, this is some great songs. I didn't sing on any of these, right? So I, I've got no skin in the game. But uh, as you're making the trip to Starkville, and maybe you're looking after you get done with the Boneyard and said, hey, I want to get all hyped up and listen to some good tracks, you put this on. But understand, this long-haired guys with guitars, okay? And if that's offensive to you, it may not work for you. But again, as always, thanks for your support of the top 10 list. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Bookmart, a Stark Billion institution. I love Campus Bookmart. I love the selection there. I love the pricing there. Most of all, I love the service there. The lovely, talented Susie, Miss Pam Menyard, everybody up there does such a great job. You walk in, they make you feel at home. Miss Kathy Brown doing an amazing job, making sure that you guys have the latest and greatest selection of Mississippi State merchandise. Bully Shop has been completely renovated. It's all upstairs now. No longer in the textbook business. Campus Bookmart doing a great job outfitting a wonderful fan base with Mississippi State merchandise. If you can't make it to town to see their smiling faces, visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. That is BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. That gets you free shipping over any online order, over 75 bucks. Any order less than 75 absolutely incomplete. Be sure and check them out today at Campus Bookmart. All right, let's take a look around the league our friends at Kentucky got absolutely crushed last night. An incredible explosion offensively uh, for LSU in this ball game. They just jumped all over Kentucky. It is eleven to one after two innings, and then fourteen to one after three. Kentucky tried to climb back in a little bit and uh, scored five runs unanswered, but LSU ends the game in the eighth. They walk it off, sixteen to six winners. And that's on eight hits. You walk people, you lose. Simple as that. Gavin Dugas, talented second baseman from LSU, uh, went down with an ankle injury. He's having a great year this year, hitting 340 uh, for the Tigers. But uh, they jumped on uh, Zach Heiss from Kentucky. One and two-thirds of an innings pitch, four hits, 11 runs. Six of them earned. Uh, three walks. Three strikeouts, two home runs, and uh, Kentucky kind of booted the ball around a little bit too. That's just not something you expect from them, but uh, two errors in the ball game, both of them costly. Paul Skeens, uh, another big outing for him. He only goes six innings pitched, but um, again, do a ton of pitches. Pitch efficiency has not been a strong point for him, even though he has been dominant. 13 Ks in the ball game, six innings pitched, seven hits, five runs, four of them earned. Also had the walk there. ERA now of 1.69, which is outstanding. The Tigers only used two pitchers in the ball games. Cooper goes the last two, uh, two hits and one run allowed. Two Ks, no walks, uh, and that's not even one of the better arms. So, Kentucky threw five pitchers last night, kind of spread it around among some young guys. Once the game is lost, there's no point wasting uh, any arms, and they didn't. So LSU game one winners in that series against Kentucky. And we just kind of said, you know, maybe Kentucky can get one. Uh, Because it's tough to win at Alex Box, as we know. All right, A&M also big winners last night, 13-5 over Missouri. Boy, Missouri 
you talk about struggling. They they won that little college baseball classic earlier this year. They sweep Tennessee, and you're thinking, okay, well, uh, Steve Beezerball is uh, headed in the right direction. It has not been good ever since. They're now 21 and 12 overall. Won some midweek games, really struggling in the league play, just four and nine uh, in the league. So the Bulldogs, you know, a half game behind them, and so hopefully we can catch them uh, this evening again. 13 to five winners, and A and M just blows it open there in the third inning in that ball game. It's a it's a one one game in the third. Missouri takes a three one lead, and then A and M posts nine in the home half of the third inning to really put the game away, and from there it just kind of managed it. Uh, from there, but uh, not a good outing uh, for the Tigers, to say the least. Uh, Lunsford just goes two innings, what hit, five runs, all of them earned. Six walks in the ball game. Runs, walks get you beat, simple as that. The game is over. They bring in uh, Whistler, who gets one, one out and allows five runs. Uh, that's not going to get it done either. Not going to get it done at all. So, A&M, a big win. We, we really need them to split. We don't need either team to kind of jump ahead of us, but the um, reality of it is for Mississippi State, we got to win some ball games. All right, let's take a quick look at the standings here as we, uh, you know, everybody kind of gets rolling again today. Vanderbilt leads the league and the SEC East with 11 1 record in conference, 27 6 overall. South Carolina 9 2, Florida 9 3. Of course, South Carolina and LSU didn't complete their series last week, so that'll be a deal we have to kind of. Contend with all year with those two teams. Kentucky now nine and four. I still contend to you, Kentucky's going to make tournament. They got to pick up five SEC wins somewhere, and I believe they will. Uh, Tennessee now five and seven. Missouri four and nine. Georgia three and nine. So you're get, beginning to see some real separation in the East. The West things are a lot more convoluted. LSU now eight and four. Arkansas eight and four. A and M six and seven. I'm I'm still not sold on the Aggies. Alabama four and eight, Auburn four and eight, of course State three and nine, Ole Miss two and ten, and uh, somebody from the state of Mississippi going to be really unhappy after this weekend. Hopefully, it's not us. All right, looking at our schedule. South Carolina is at Vanderbilt. That is a huge series there. As good as South Carolina has been, Vanderbilt's got some really good pitching, perhaps elite starting pitching, and you know what they have in Maldonado, one of the best closers in the game. He doesn't get a lot of hype, but the guy's very, very effective. I like Vanderbilt to win the series at their place, two games to one. I'd like to see South Carolina win because I'm not a proponent of how uh, Tim Corbett and Vandy run the college baseball program, just not. And, again, I know that it's not anything illegal. It's just I think it's unethical. They'd be a fool not to do it, I guess. you got to be good at something. Missouri and Texas A&M will play tonight. That's a uh, 6 p.m. first pitch. Missouri trying to even the series there. You like the Aggies at home and the fact that Missouri just hasn't been very good. Uh, Ole Miss at Mississippi State, I've told you guys, I I expect State to take the series two games to one. Georgia is at Florida. We're not going to catch Florida, but certainly we can surpass Georgia. And we really need Florida to sweep the series to kind of give us some margin to work with here. I like Florida at home. I don't think Georgia's going to be able to score against Florida pitching. We're going to go ahead and call the sweep here. I think Florida sweeps this series. Auburn at Alabama, you know, you're rooting interest here with two teams that are just a game ahead of us in the standings is you want to split. That's what you want. You want the split. You don't want anybody to get a sweep here and, and hope that you can catch both teams. But uh, uh, it's going to be interesting. Auburn can can pitch it. They can't really score. That Alabama offense is not especially prolific. They're scrappy, though. They're scrappy. You know, Williamson's a good player, you know, for sure. Jim Jarvis is a good player, uh, to say the least. But uh, Seidel, I think, is a straw that stirs the drink. They need him to have a big weekend. And then Kentucky at LSU again uh, tonight. You know, Kentucky and Nick Mangion, they're scrappy. And I'm sure they're thinking, we just got to go up here and get one. I, I think they will. And it's probably the Saturday game, game three of the series. But uh, the Tigers with Skeens on the mound, you, you expect them to win all of those games, even though they haven't. You know, Arkansas kind of got after them a little bit too. But uh, you like LSU 2-1 to one here. But Tennessee to Arkansas, that, that's a big one there. That'll be on the SEC Network. If you remember, they released the SEC schedule and had Tennessee and Arkansas not playing each other for the second consecutive year. They pull it back. They reevaluate the schedule. And now you've got Tennessee going back to Fayetteville. Going to be awfully interesting down there 
no love lost between Dave Van Horn and Tony Botello, even though they have a history together. You know, you know the hog pen is going to be wild with Tennessee coming in. Again, they don't like Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee obviously uh, has been a team that has made some enemies within the league and uh, struggling a little bit right now. I like Arkansas to take the series two games to one. Obviously, uh, you know, Tennessee struggled last weekend. And uh, really, Tennessee not having the season that many people expected, and even with a two games to one loss to Arkansas, you'd expect them to stay in the top 25. But Tennessee really in danger of dropping out of the hosting discussion. And I'd say when you look at this Tennessee schedule, you know, you look at it early on and you think, okay, they should be okay, should be okay, should be okay. And then they just haven't been. You know, you, you drop three to start the season to Missouri, and really only one of those games was competitive. Then you sweep A&M. You lose two out of three to LSU. You lose two out of three to Florida. And now you're getting ready to play Arkansas. From there, you got Vanderbilt at your place, and then Mississippi State. You go to Georgia. You get Kentucky and then South Carolina. And you start looking at that and say, okay, well, what's realistic for this team? They could probably win a couple series. But, but that said – a lot of toss-ups. You know, you'd say, hey, they should probably beat Mississippi State. But, you know, what kind of, what kind of psyche are the volunteers going to have if, if you lose this series to Arkansas and then you get embarrassed by Vanderbilt, then all of a sudden you start racking up and you think, okay, it's double-digit losses when Mississippi State gets there. And uh, I think at that point, State starts thinking, hey, maybe we can go up here and get these guys. Then they have to travel to Georgia. And uh, Georgia, not necessarily the great offensive park there, but uh, Georgia's probably good enough to get a game. And then you host Kentucky and you finish the year at South Carolina, two teams that are going to be playing for something. And so this Tennessee team could have a very disappointing year. Absolutely could. But the reality of it is it's a very talented Tennessee team that just hasn't played up to their potential at this point. And, again, they play you know, three of the four teams ahead of them in the SEC schedule. So they still have some time to climb into it. But you start thinking, you're 23 and 10 and 5 and 7 in the conference. And you still got six weekends left. You know, what, what's realistic? What's realistic for this team? Interesting, to say the least. And obviously, we're chasing, you know, everybody in the standings to make sure that, uh, you know, we're one of the dozen teams up there. But it's, it's so much bigger than that. It's not just about making Hoover. That's never our goal at Mississippi State. That's, that should be a given. But after what we've experienced the last couple of years, you start thinking, well, you know, maybe that's all we can hope for. I, again, if we can get to 13 SEC wins, we can make a regional. And when I begin to think about Alabama and Auburn being ahead of us, I, I think there's a good chance we catch both of them. Of course, we go to Auburn next weekend. But uh, looking at their schedules, you know, with Alabama, you know, obviously we win that series against them. And you look at what's ahead for them, and, of course, we still got to play LSU and Arkansas, too. So, you know, there's some games out there that we're going to drop in some series, obviously, that uh, we could struggle with. But, you know, Alabama, of course, will host Auburn this weekend and then travel to Missouri, then travel to LSU, then they get Vanderbilt, Texas A&M, and Ole Miss. And so if you're Alabama, you think, hey, you know, there's some games here that are winnable for us. You certainly like, uh, you know, they're at home. It's a toss-up series against Auburn. You like their chances at Missouri next week. You don't like them at LSU and Vanderbilt. And you got to go on the road at A and M, and maybe A and M starting to play better, and you end up at Ole Miss, and you you know that Ole Miss, Mike Bianco always tends to find a way in May. You know they'll struggle and struggle and struggle, and all of a sudden they win a series and nobody's expecting them to win. But that could be a desperate weekend with Alabama and Ole Miss, for sure. We talk about Auburn. What they have ahead, of course, you know about this weekend, and then State travels there next weekend. Then they're at South Carolina. They host LSU, they're at Ole Miss, and then finish up at Missouri. So those last two weekends, I'm sure Butch and those guys are thinking, hey, those are winnable weekends for us. And I'm sure they're probably looking at us thinking, hey, if we go out here and throw strikes, we could we could beat Mississippi State. But among those two teams, I think you may even favor the Alabama schedule over, over the uh, Auburn schedule, even though they both get Missouri. And both of those teams have got to feel like, hey, we have got to win uh, these series. Now, we talk about Ole Miss – and, of course, uh, double-digit losses already in the conference. And you still got 18 games to play. And so, is it a 10-20 and 20 type year? Yeah. 
Ole Miss is going to be in desperation mode when they get here this weekend. So anybody expecting Ole Miss to show up and feel sorry for themselves, kidding themselves. Of course, Ole Miss is here, and then next weekend they host LSU. Supposed to have the return of Hunter Elliott, but what kind of shape is he in? You're right. So, you know, just kind of like the Kate Smith situation, just getting a guy back is big. But you kind of wonder what the stamina looks like. Well, then they host Georgia, and you got to think if you're Ole Miss, even though Georgia can pitch it really well, that should be a series you can win. And then they travel to Missouri, and I don't know if I could pick Missouri over anybody right now. And then Auburn. And then Alabama. So the schedule is favorable for Ole Miss during the month of May. you got to navigate through Super Bulldog weekend and then get through next weekend with LSU. And then you start thinking, hey, these last four series, we got a shot. And they do. It's a much more favorable schedule for Ole Miss than there is for Mississippi State down the stretch, which makes this weekend all the more important. We absolutely can ill afford to drop this series. If if we do, barring some miracle – Chances of us making the postseason are going to be pretty slim. We've got to find a way uh, to win this series. And, again, you start looking at the Bulldog schedule. Ole Miss, for sure, right? you got to win that one. And then you got to win next weekend at Auburn. And then that leaves you with, at Tennessee, probably the best you can hope for is to get a game up there. But you never know. You never know. That's what the reason we play the games. Arkansas comes in here. I'm not completely sold on this Arkansas team. I don't think they're as good as the teams they've had the last couple of years, and really maybe even dating back to 18. But they're a good team. And then we got to go to LSU. We finish up with A&M. But you start looking here and it's okay, well, who should we beat? You know, I don't, I don't know. Outside of these next two weekends, if you look at a schedule outside of maybe A&M, would, I don't think anybody's going to pick State to win at Knoxville or to beat Arkansas or to beat LSU. And so you start – kind of navigating through that and figure, okay, that's maybe you can get, just avoid getting swept there and uh, pick up, you know, three games, right? Pick up three SEC wins. Well, that pushes you to six. But, you, again, you got to get to 13, which means you've got to find a way to beat Ole Miss, Auburn, and A&M at a minimum. And you need to get a sweep of somebody. And it would be great if it come this weekend. But uh, the schedule, obviously, a little more, uh, a little more favorable for Ole Miss down the stretch. But uh, all we can do is all we can do, and that's the play the teams in front of us. So it starts tonight. And so, again, we need Cade Smith to go out there and give us a good start. We need a bullpen to hopefully uh, pitch with a lead and find a way to get a dub. And, and baseball is a game of momentum. You know, I can't even begin to imagine walking out there on Saturday with 20,000 screaming fans, most of them Bulldogs, you know, as I mentioned on Bo Bound's show today, it's like there's a lot of pressure playing in front of those guys. That, that That's true. It's a crowd that big, there's a lot of pressure that comes along with that. But I'd rather have those people cheering for me than against me. That's why it's so important late in the ball game we get runners on base. The dude effect takes over. The maroon and white chant gets all riled up. The let's go state thing gets going. And all of a sudden you got a young kid out there trying to think about uh, looking at his wristband and throwing a strike and, and you guys are in his ear. It's an important aspect of it. We really need the crowd to be into the game. So don't come to do Noble Field this weekend and sit on your hands. You're not there to just be entertained. You're there to be part of the ball game in a respectful way. We don't need anybody doing things stupid. But the reality of it is we need a very vocal crowd all weekend long. That absolutely has to happen. It's very, very important that there is a true home field advantage. And not just because there's a bunch of people out there we're in maroon. We need very vocal fans this weekend. All right, final segment of the show brought to you, as always, by Portico. If I was moving to Starkville now, I'd move to Portico. There really wouldn't be much question about that. I love that place out there. I do. I'm out here in the sticks, but I tell you, if I was considering making a move, I'd move to Portico. Just 1.1 miles away from the Mississippi State campus. You can start with a two-bedroom, two-bath home, go all the way up to a four-bedroom, four-bath home. Phase one's completely sold out. Your new neighbor is already enjoying life in Starkville. Phase two, under development now. Many of those homes are sold, but there are some available. And if you're not in any hurry and say, hey, Steve, we want to build, they can accommodate that too. You can pick out a lot, have some say in your housing plans. If you need a custom build, they can accommodate you there too. It's nice to have people that are plugged in at Starkville, that are invested in Starkville, helping you guys find a home, whether it be your primary residence, your future retirement home, your second home. Maybe it's an investment property. I don't know what your needs are, but they can get you taken care of. 
Give Brooks Bryan a text or call today at 601-416-8075. Again, that's 601-416-8075. Make Portico your next move. Okay, uh, Maroon and White game on Saturday. I mentioned there's a handful of guys not going to play in the game. Don't look for Woody Marks to have a lot going on, and that's okay. We know what Woody can do. I've said on the show before, I think Woody Marks is probably the biggest beneficiary of this change in offensive style. I think he is going to be a star in the SEC. Not just considered a good back or a tough back or a tough guy to bring down in the open field. I think he is going to have a career year this year. I think he is a guy that will be, in many respects, the star of the Bulldog offense. I really believe that. Simeon Price is a guy that uh, has been up and down a little bit at times with injury. Uh, we, we don't win the bowl game without him. He was outstanding. Of course, Dylan Johnson did not participate in the game, but he's at Washington. Been kind of banged up, too. Uh, but the reality of it is is that I think this, this running back room has a chance to be really good. Jeffrey Pittman's a guy that I know you guys are eager to see in action. Kind of plays that Dylan Johnson role. A guy that can kind of get behind his pads and get downhill on people. Um, so that's important. And then Jaden Crumbody, you're not going to see much from him, if at all. Uh, Bookie Watson's not going to play. Judd Johnson's the guy that's been out most of the spring. So you're going to see some new names out there. And listen, you don't ever learn anything from a spring game. You don't. You're going to go out there and you're going to have some fun. It's kind of the cap of spring spring ball. And so it's fun to see your team and your stadium kind of throwing the ball around and you can see some nice individual performances and maybe you see some flashes from some guys that you're unfamiliar with. And you got to pull out that program and say, hey, who's so-and-so? A lot of talk about Xavier Thomas, uh, him being back. Obviously, he entered the portal and then withdrew from the portal, returned to Mississippi State. Uh, he's a special player, and not just as a punt returner. He is a guy that's going to be a lot more involved in the offense this year. Uh, Tulu Griffin, obviously, is going to be greater utilized. He has been underutilized his entire career here at State, and that, that's not being negative. That's just stating the fact. You know, the whole feed Tulu moment movement, I'm a big part of that you got to get the ball in the hands of your most dynamic playmakers, and he certainly is one of State's fastest and most elusive players. He's a guy, if you miss a tackle, it's going to be six. And so you got to find a way to get him in space where he's not always having to run uphill and, and face all this traffic in the open field. That's an important aspect of this. And I think Barbe is a guy that's going to do a good job creating mismatches that get our playmakers in space. And that's really probably the thing you want to see most this weekend is what's this new offense going to look like? We didn't have tight ends the last few years. Now, all of a sudden, we do. We've had to convert some guys from wide receiver and offensive line, turn them into tight ends. What will the packages look like? How does that impact the running game? What does that do for the boot action passing game? You know, it's going to be a completely different offense in many respects. While it will still have some air raid concepts, we're going to be much more balanced and we're going to be a team that gets downhill on people at times. And how many times have we been in those situations on third and short and uh, we couldn't go get a couple yards? And a lot of that was schematic, right? I mean, you know, you got to pitch and catch it there. And sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. But on third and short, you really want to be able to run the football, right? Uh, and so at times we did. And we had some greater success last year because of the maturation of Woody Marks and Dylan Johnson. But that's the main thing for tomorrow, I think, is, you know, what's – you know, what, what's this new look offense? You know, what is this about? What can we expect? It's going to look completely different than what we did. And, there, again, there will be some passing elements that are similar to what you've seen. But, uh, you know, Barbe did a great job at Appalachian State uh, last year. And that was year one. And he goes out there and, and com- completely re- revolutionizes their offense. They're, they were good. They were. And I think when you go back and you begin to think about – the things that State did well last year, I think quarterback play at times is really good. Down a stretch, it wasn't. But I think it's going to take a lot of the pressure off Will Rogers' shoulders because I think we're going to be a lot better running the football. There were times last year where we, we couldn't run the football, so we became very predictable, which in turn allowed the defense to kind of get after your quarterback. I think what you're going to see is Will Rogers take another step this year. I really do. And, and listen, down the stretch last year, Will took some chances with the football. Didn't play well in the Egg Bowl. Didn't play exceptionally well in the bowl game. But there were a couple of drives there where Will kind of willed us into the end zone, pardon the pun. You know, that drive at Ole Miss just before the half. And, of course, the touchdown pass to Justin Robinson uh, in the bowl game that was later reviewed and found to be correct. You know, those are Will Rogers kind of leading the huddle there. 
I just think you're going to make him a lot – you're going to give him more weapons to work with uh, because of this offense. He, all of the pressure won't fall so much to his shoulders. And uh, Will has had a, a great career here at Mississippi State. He's set a bunch of records. But I think you're going to win some ball games this year that people aren't expecting because of the fact that the offense is going to be a lot less predictable. Right? I mean, we, we saw it in year one when everybody started doing drop eight. We started thinking, well, if this is, if this is all it takes – and back then, you know, wide receivers, of course, in Mississippi State had never seen that. You hadn't seen a lot of zone coverage except on third and long because you didn't have playmakers that could burn people and people were just trying to keep the game in front of them. And so, going to be a much different deal. Now, we did speak with Arnett. I'm a huge Zach Arnett fan. Not just as a football coach, but as a person. I really like him a lot. Uh, even though he grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, he's a Southern Rock guy. He is. Loves Almond Brothers, loves some Skinner, loves Black Crows. And uh, so it kind of fits with us. And one of the things that I can tell you that's very genuine about Zach Arnett is that he and his family love it here at Starkville, Mississippi. A lot of people out there want to talk about Starkville and talk poorly of us. And uh, Zach and his family love it. And after spending some time in Albuquerque, I can kind of see why. All due respect to the fine folks in New Mexico. It just doesn't fit for me and my family. But, um, you know, Zach has this genuine excitement about the program, uh, about the ability to recruit players here, about the recruiting footprint, uh, loves his coaching staff, and is extremely grateful to Mississippi State. And you see that, especially when the cameras go off. I mean, he's very good in front of the camera, but Zach is kind of one of the guys. And what I mean by that is, is like yesterday after our media session, he kind of sat out there and had a bull session with us. You know, and just, he's like asking, hey, what's going on with this? And I say, hey, Steve, what should I expect in baseball? And, Paul, what's going on with the basketball transfer portal? And what's going to happen here? He has a genuine interest in everything that's happening at Mississippi State. It's not just, okay, I've got this singleness of purpose, so I'm just going to worry about my job. Uh, Zach is a fan of Mississippi State sports. He and his family will be out at Duty Noble Field this weekend uh, coming to baseball games. He's excited about the atmosphere. And as I've shared with you guys before, a lot of people didn't understand that Zach began his college athletics career as a baseball player at UNM. Yeah, and then decided to go out football. It's a crazy story. It really is. But the reality of it is, is I think we have a head coach, number one, that uh, has a great defensive scheme that is difficult to prepare for. But he also has this charisma that I think his guys want to play hard for him. I tell you, those guys on defense love playing for Zach Arnett. And I think now that he's in charge of all these guys, I think as a result, you're going to see a different esprit de corps with this team. And listen, let's be honest about it. I mean, as much as I love Mike Leach and love those coaches that were here, there were times, you know, we had some struggles and there were times that guys got frustrated. We had some big games, too, but we had some games, too, where, you know, if, if people took certain things away from us, we were, kind of, we were kind of helpless at times on offense. We didn't have a good counter. Now we do. But I think what's interesting, too, about Zach is he has not let any of this get to him. Right? Okay, he's a young head coach. He comes here, and, and you put together a good resume, and the next thing you know, you're the head coach here under, under difficult circumstances. But – he is the same guy today. As a matter of fact, he might even be a better guy today than he was when he got here. I think he's a lot more confident and sure of himself. I think he's a guy that understands the opportunities in front of him. And, again, he's incredibly grateful to Mississippi State officials for giving him an opportunity. I think what's best for the team, I think our fan base, and you can see in the ticket numbers, a lot of discussion that we may act if we set a program record this year in season ticket sales. So people are voting with their attendance, and they're voting with their support. And I expect a huge crowd uh, at the spring game. Not exactly sure how many of you will make it, but uh, it's going to start at noon. And baseball will start at 3. So we had to watch the spring game. You walk over to Duty Noble, if, provided you have a ticket, and watch a ball game. But every time that I'm around Zach, and again, the, the press conferences are great, but any time that I'm just kind of around him, I get this feeling that, you know, Zach is a guy that's here to stay. Now, that's not to say three, four years from now, if he's put together some good years, that somebody won't come headhunting, and perhaps his agent's like, hey, you know, you kind of owe it to yourself. I don't get the sense in any way whatsoever that Zach Arnett is going to put us through what Dan Mullen put us through every single offseason. 
I just don't see it that way at all. I don't think Zach is that kind of person. I mean, the fact that Zach was willing to sign what was believed to be the highest buyout for an assistant coach in the country says a lot about his commitment to Mississippi State and commitment to Starkville. And just kind of sitting there talking with him yesterday, I asked him about his trip back home to New Mexico and places that he ate and things, places that he'd been, uh, some things that I had seen and learned out there. And he's so interested in hearing that. He's like, oh, it's my hometown. So did you eat here? Did you eat there? You know, uh, he doesn't get back there an awful lot, but he is a guy that uh, is more than eager to talk to you about what's going on with him. But he's also a guy, too, that has this alpha dog quality. And you kind of get that. There is this magnetism with him. It's like, you know what, this guy's going to win. So maybe I need to hitch my wagon to him. And while he may be getting a head coaching job well ahead of schedule, Again, you look at his track record and what he's done since the day that he took over, it's been remarkable. And there is some genuine excitement around practice. There is some genuine excitement around the program. And people are like, oh, well, Steve, I'm worried about recruiting. Guys, it's April. You got eight months. And I would just kind of point to the track record. What did he do last year? We closed with a top 25 class. He was able to fend off poachers of your roster. He was able to talk Xavier Thomas and the coming back, you got Tulu Griffin back in the fold and worked on Dylan Johnson. Didn't work, didn't, didn't work out. But the reality of it is, is that, uh, you know, Zach, every step of the way, has done something very, very important and has risen to the expectation. And so it is reasonable to assume going forward he will have – the same level of success. Now, listen, there's going to be some growing pains. He's a first-year head coach. We're going to make some mistakes. But one of the things for certain I can tell you is that, you know, Zach is an extremely intelligent guy and that your program is in good hands. You know, when we got Mike Leach, and Mike was a friend, and I'll be honest with you, it's tough to go out to practice. It is for me. Maybe for other people it's a little different. It's tough. It is. And when I go out there, I expect to see him. And, uh, you know, I love seeing David Turner and Bump and those guys out there, but it's just a different deal without Leach. And so you got to figure it was probably difficult for players too, you know. And Leach, obviously, the colorful personality and a guy that curried a lot of favor with your players. I think Zach has the same quality without being as eccentric, right? He's not the guy out there that's talking about, uh, you know, uh, the migrating patterns of rainbow trout and things of that nature. That, that's just not his interest level. But your players respect Zach Arnett. They do. On both sides of the football, they do. And they understand that Zach is a winner. And you go back and look at the numbers and how we defensed Illinois and how we defensed Ole Miss. And, uh, you know, really our defense gave us a chance in every game in some respects. And we didn't always mount enough offense. And so you start thinking, okay, well, what's broken or what needs to be repaired? What needs to change? Well, you feel good about your defensive effort. Maybe you can put some things together on the offensive end that kind of works in concert. And there were a lot of people that were very critical of Zach, you know, didn't keep any of the offensive coaches, completely changing the philosophy. Perhaps that confuses the players. And, uh, you know, obviously we wanted to run the football a little bit more And rather than go run the triple option or something like that, we go out and get somebody that has some elements of the air raid in their scheme, but it's more of a physical brand of football in many respects. And so I don't know what you're going to learn on Saturday. I mean, our our whole goal is to get through the game without anybody getting hurt, right? That's the goal, right? And for you guys to all have a good time. But I truly believe there are some good days ahead of us. We always talk about it's all about relationships and it's all about people. And, you know, we, we talk about X's and O's and Jimmy's and Joe's and things of that nature. When you look at the great leaders in our sport, and really in all sport, there is always somebody that is setting the vision for the program and then chasing it with reckless abandon. I see those qualities in Zach Arnett. I'm extremely excited, not just about this season, because the schedule is favorable. But I'm excited to see what Zach's going to do now that he has the keys to the car. You look at what we did under difficult circumstances last year. You know, there were so many people that were like, oh, we're going to make a coaching change. We ultimately did, but not for the reasons that people expected, unfortunately. 
But I go back and I think about how many head coaches have been thrown into a situation like that. Not only does your head coach pass away, but a guy that gave you your first real chance. A guy that believed in you. A guy that fought for you and ensured that your family was fairly compensated. You lose that. And then you've got, you know, 105 players out here. They're absolutely heartbroken. And so to keep that in the road and then to take some coaches that, of course, that were worried about their own futures and put together a game plan to go win the ReliaQuest Bowl, which is one of the biggest bowl wins in school history. Obviously, that match with the Orange Bowl, but you understand my point here. How many people were thrown into that completely unaware of what was happening in dealing with their own broken heart and then was able to keep this thing together? It's remarkable. It says a lot about Zach Arnett as a person, as a coach, and it says a lot about those, those men around him. He goes out, puts his own staff together, does a great job. And I'll be honest with you, this is one of the most excited springs that I've had. And I haven't been out there a whole lot, been out there, I guess, at three practices. Um, and got there yesterday, you know, a bit late for, for media. Uh, I know Paul Jones has been out there every I think Paul, I think Paul is the only media guy that's been there every day. And, uh, of course, he does little, you know, updates, you know, hey, everywhere I saw a practice today. And I can just tell you, you know, being around people that have been around spring practice a lot, there is this genuine exuberance about the future, but also, too, about the season. It's like, hey, we're going to be good in time. Zach's going to win in time. But it's like, no, we're going to be good this year. But if there's ever been any question about, hey, was Arnett the right guy? I think he's going to answer that. And I think it's going to – instead of it being a question mark, there's going to be an exclamation point at the end that, yeah, the guy was ready. He was ready. And, again, be patient. There will be some times that, uh, you know, things won't go the way we want. You're here in year one. I mean, again, I, I think we get some grace because the schedule is so favorable. But uh, I like the fact that a lot of people out there aren't sure what to expect of Mississippi State because I think Zach Garnett and his staff are going to surprise some people. So we've got a veteran team. People forget that we had a veteran team with a favorable schedule. It's like, oh, it's first-year coach. He's not the typical first-year coach, folks. Zach Arnett is a winner, and he will continue to make Mississippi State a winner. And no matter what happens on Saturday, it's not going to impact the season unless somebody gets injured, and God forbid they do, right? But I think once we get into the summer and you begin to think, hey, it's so much fun to go to Mississippi State football games, I, I think there is probably more fun ahead of you than, you than you realize. I truly do. I'm excited about the future with Zach Garnett at the helm of Mississippi State football. That's going to do it for today. If you hadn't done so, go to dogpiledbook.com. All my sports books are there with the exception of Stark Villains. You'll have to find those in stores. Alpha Dog's not far behind that. Plenty of dog pile and, and still a good bit of flim flam left. Uh, so be sure and check those books out. Go to dogpilethebook.com. All of them are there, uh, again, with the exception of Stark Villains. And then Blooms of Oleander, we mentioned that earlier. If you need Stark Villains gear, go to starkvillains.com. Give mom, dad, whoever, kids, everybody Stark Villain shirts. They all deserve them. If you're not a member of jeanspage.com, come over and be a part of our great community, part of the 247 Sports Network. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live.